Well, good morning, Encounter. How's everybody today? Hey, there's a couple people awake. That's good. Hey, last year at that Cookies and Canvas, I know you kind of got to be a girl to be there, but I got to come because I was on the cleanup crew and they have really good leftovers. And so um, if somebody asked you to be a part of the cleanup crew, I would, I would bite on that um, because it's, it's good stuff. Well, we have just finished uh, last week the series on heaven. And the focus of that series was based on our hope that one day all things would be made right, everything would be renewed or made new. And I know that Pastor Rob presented some different ideas maybe that would challenge, has challenged your past thinking about what heaven is going to be like. So I just want to uh, encourage you that if you want to go back and hear some of those messages, you can go online, uh, you can listen to the one that you missed, or you can go and listen to the whole, whole series. But today, as you can see, we begin a new series entitled The Prince of Peace. And our anchor verse for this series is Isaiah 9-6. And Isaiah speaks some prophetic words about the coming of Jesus. And this is what he says. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. From our vantage point, when we read a verse like that, we are likely lulled into kind of a Christmas-like feeling. There's, there is a certain nostalgia that comes with those kind of words when we hear the Christmas story. The story brings us joy, it brings us comfort as we remember our Savior's birth while we are living in a relative time of Eve's. But truth be told, if we were to look back at what was going on during these prophetic times when those words were first spoken, times could hardly be compared to something of relative ease. When Isaiah wrote these words, he was pre predicting the coming of the wonderful counselor, our mighty God, the Prince of Peace. He was spurring the people of Israel to remember that their Messiah indeed was, a com was coming to establish his kingdom. Yet Isaiah was writing nearly 800 years before the birth of Jesus Christ. Now this period of history was filled with some pretty big upheaval. The Assyrians were on the march. And they were aggressively taking people into captivity by droves. And Isaiah's prophecy of the coming king gave the people of God a hope a hope that they so desperately needed in a time when things were very uncertain. A hope that everything would one day be made right. Now there may be for you a feeling of frustration starting to uh, build in the back of your mind when you realize that the birth of Jesus Christ wouldn't happen for another 800 years. Now how would, how would Jesus' birth in 800 years have an impact on their present situation? In fact, you might even be wondering, how is it that the presence of Jesus Christ is going to help me in my situation? The answer to those questions, I believe, can be found in the words, Wonderful Counselor. So a little more about this Wonderful Counselor, I want us to turn ahead to chapter 2 in, in uh, the book of Luke. And I just want to read this together with you. In those days... Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and the line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him, and was expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger, because there was no guest room available for them. This lowly birth really is not what we would esteem as wonderful, is it? In fact, today we might even be willing to question Mary and Joseph's ability to think ahead. We would say, hey, 
you didn't even plan for this trip? We would think maybe that they weren't very prepared, but fortunately for us, the word wonderful doesn't derive its meaning from their immediate struggle to find housing for the night, or even from being born in a stable. So I'd like to talk this morning for just a minute about what the word wonderful means so that we can understand it in a correct context. As, as Americans, often if, if we were to say something like, oh, that's, that's wonderful, we might think of a situation that maybe is adv ad advantageous for us somehow. Maybe there's something of high value or something that is very pleasing to us, but that's not what wonderful means in this context of wonderful counselor. So I did a little checking in Judges chapter 13, and this is not going to be on your screen. You can just eavesdrop a little bit while I fill you in. But in Judges chapter 13, verse 7, 17, there's a conversation between Samson's dad and an angel of the Lord. And during this exchange, um, Samson's dad, whose name is Manoah, asks the angel, what is your name? Well, this angel responds to him and he says, why do you ask my name? It is beyond your understanding. So when we read of this wonderful counselor in Isaiah 9, 6, the word wonderful here is used in the same tense. We have a counselor who is beyond our understanding. Now for us, that doesn't mean that he doesn't exist. Uh, it doesn't mean that we, that we can somehow put him in a, a, a box. I mean, that's what we tend to do when we explain away as, as fantasy the things that we can't see or, under, or understand. We, we don't want to give them any power. So the second part of this title, of the Messiah's title, is the word counselor. In ancient Israel, a counselor was portrayed as a wise king, a king such as Solomon, someone who's able to give guidance to his people. Isaiah uses the word again in chapter 28, verses 29, to, ascribe, or to describe the Lord. He says this, he says, He's wonderful in counsel, excellent in wisdom. Jesus is able to advise his people thoroughly because he's qualified in ways that no human counselor is. Colossians 2.3 says, In Christ is hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Psalm 139 would include the knowledge of all human nature. So Jesus' position as our wonderful counselor means that we can trust him to listen to our problems, to guide us in the right direction, we can be certain that he has our best interest at heart because he loves us. So speaking of our best interest for us, I want to look at a conversation that took place between Jesus and his disciples in John chapter 14. Now on the, on the front side of things, it would not seem that what Jesus conveys to his disciples is in their best interest. And just think about how you would feel. Jesus has just informed those that were physically closest to him, those that were spiritually close to his, closest to him, that he was going to be leaving them. Physically in body, Jesus would no longer be present. Now, I would imagine that the conversation that they were having, there was some panic that was beginning to take place wouldn't you? A panic that is not unlike when we have been told that someone is going to pass away. Somebody that's very close to us. So if it were us, if it were me, I would probably be having a hard time trying to focus. My insecurities, uh, my fears would all be at a climax. I can remember, well, it will be five years in February, my, my brother Rick and I, we drove down to, to Lansing to see my brother Tom. And Tom had called us during the week and asked us to come down to visit him. He had received a, a prognosis from his doctor that was not very good concerning his cancer. He had stage 4 cancer when they found it. So my brother Rick and I go down to visit him and we go out for a car, a ride in the car, and we're driving down the road. And Tom looks over at Rick and I, and he goes, Boys, 
He said, I would imagine that the Heavenly Father is putting the final touches on my mansion right now. And um, so we, we, we pulled over, because that's not a conversation to have while you're driving down the road. We pulled over in this orchard, and we had some tears, and we reminisced, and we hurt that we were going um, to we miss Tom. But my brother Rick, wise words of a firstborn, says, everybody take a deep breath. <laughs> so that's what we, we did. We took a deep breath. And I can just imagine our wonderful counselor, the one who's beyond all of our understanding, the one who embodies all wisdom, speaks into the fear of the disciples at this very moment. He says, everybody just take a deep breath. <laughs> it's going to be okay. And then John 14, verses 15 through 8, records these words. He says, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept it because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Slowly, Jesus begins to burst the bubble of their pain. So in this last series on heaven, there was this continual focus on hope. There was a, the understanding that all things would be made right. And as the disciples' worst fears are being realized, as our worst fears are being realized, Jesus gave them and to each one of us what I would call a present hope. In reference to his leaving, Jesus says, I will give you another counselor. I can just see the looks of confusion on the disciples' faces. They're wondering, what, who is this other counselor? It would require a little bit more explaining on Jesus' part and for us before any understanding would take place about who this wonderful counselor is. John 14 gives us a little bit of information about the Holy Spirit. And I just wanted us to understand a couple of those things. He is not visible to our eye, but his presence is discernible in our lives. And Jesus goes on to talk of the counselor as if he's an extension of himself. Not somebody different, but an extension of himself. I want us to hang our hat here for just a minute because I want to make sure that our understanding is clear. When someone, when someone close to us passes away, we say things like, he or she will always be in my heart, right? But what we mean by that is those memories that we had, all of those treasured memories we're gonna, that we possess, we're going to continue to keep them alive through those memories as a way of somehow reliving our experiences with them and keeping them from fading from our consciousness. That's not what Jesus is telling the disciples right now. He's letting, him, him, he's letting them know that his own presence will become manifested inside of each one of them through this other counselor who our scripture required, or refers to as the Holy Spirit. I will not leave you as orphans, he says. I will come to you. Jesus will not fade from our consciousness he will become our consciousness. So the purpose of the Holy Spirit is not just to help keep some distant memory of Jesus Christ alive in the hearts of his disciples who are still here on earth, but he's to be a living, active agent in our redemptive process, working to make us like Jesus Christ from the inside out. I like, I like to refer to the, to the Holy Spirit as the workhorse of the Trinity. The functions and the activities of the Holy Spirit are well documented in Scripture. We're going to go over some of those in a, in a moment. But in order for Jesus' disciples to have access to the Holy Spirit, in order for you and I today to have access to the Holy Spirit, Jesus had to leave. In a physical body, Jesus Christ had limitations. Yes, Jesus had limitations. It, 
though fully divine, fully God, he had humbled himself, he had set aside his divine capabilities while he was here on the earth and he was in a body that he might become a part of the human experience. But physically, Jesus couldn't be in two places at once, could he? Can you be in two places at once? Not, not me. The work pulls me that way some days. Um, he couldn't be in two places at one time. Yet he knew in spirit if he left, everyone could have access to him at any moment. He was leaving a few physically so that he could be with everybody eternally in spirit. So remember now, the purpose of the Holy Spirit is living and active. He isn't present to just be a remembrance of past memories. The Holy Spirit is to do things specifically. He's to teach us, according to John 14, 26. He's, in the, he's to intercede for us before the Father. He'll give us strength in times of need. He will speak with God's authority. He will give us freedom. He will transform the spiritual conditions of our heart and give us the ability to follow God's statutes because that is not possible underneath our own power. He's going to help us to discern spiritual truth. He marks us as God's own. He transforms us into the image of our Heavenly Father. So if you are here and you have ever experienced the Holy Spirit working in your life in one of those ways, teaching you, interceding before you, giving you strength, would you just raise your hand? Wow, that's cool. That's most, almost everybody in the, you know, put your hands back up for just a second. So if you're in the front row, turn around and look at who's behind you. Today, Christ's own people are a witness to the moving of the Holy Spirit. Scripture offers so much information about the different duties of the Holy Spirit, but I want to pause on this last one for just a minute because I think it's one of the most important, one of the most pivotal duties that he has to carry out. He transforms us into the image of our Heavenly Father. So we're currently in this season of Advent, and as, as Christ followers, we, we wrap presents and we put them underneath the Christmas tree. And we do this in remembrance of the gift that God has given to us. He has given more to us than the birth of his son, Jesus. He has given us a second gift. In the physical absence of his son, who was his first gift, the Father has given us a gift in the person of the Holy Spirit. Second Corinthians says, And we who with unveiled faces, faces all reflect the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing joy, which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the essence of the person of Jesus Christ. People write to columnists for advice. We, we, have list, we make lists of pros and cons. We consult with friend after friend for advice. We seek professional help for uh, deep issues that are going on inside of our souls. And while some of those are valid in scriptural ways, there's a lot of them that are not. But what is true is that we want to know which way to go, don't we? We want to, we want to be able to do what is right. We search for right perspectives, and we can have that through the person of the Holy Spirit. I love Chris Tigreen's words in his devotional. I was reading this not too long back, and I just wanted to share it with you today. This is what he says about Jesus. Jesus is called the Wonderful Counselor, and he calls his own spirit a counselor and a comforter. On every page of Scripture, God is reaching out with words of knowledge and wisdom for his people. He has given us more than an instruction manual. He's given us a guide. He talks us through our dilemmas. He gives us perspective on our problems. And he leads us in the way that we should go. The counselor is one of the faces of Emmanuel. God is, God is with us, not simply to put his arm around us for comfort or for encouragement, but also to give us concrete guidance and counsel in the deepest issues of our lives. That gives me hope. 
So this morning, I'd like us to dis discover how a wonderful counselor fits the description that was just given. There is a Greek word that is a, is, gives a, is a good description of the Holy Spirit. And so I was trying to figure out how to help you remember this, and so I brought something today. That Greek word is called paraclete. Not parakeet, not a pair of Pastor Pete's cleats. These are Pastor Pete's cleats. But Pastor Pete's cleats are a good representation of the function of the Holy Spirit. Notice that they are tied together, that they're tied alongside of each other. Now, I'll just leave those up there for you. Those are some bright shoes, aren't they? The word parakletos is used five times in the New Testament, four times in the Gospel of John, and one time in 1 John chapter 2 to refer to, to Jesus. And I just want those up on the, put those up on the screen to maybe to help give you a better picture of how it's translated. John 14, 16 says, The parakletos, or the Holy Spirit, will be with the disciples forever. 1426 says, the, paracle the paracletos will teach you all things. He will remind you of what I've said to you. 167 says, it is to the disciples' advantage that Jesus goes away, for if I don't go away, the paracletos, the Holy Spirit, will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Those were in reference to the Holy Spirit. 1 John 2, 1, in reference to Jesus, says, my dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense. Jesus Christ, the parakletos, the righteous one. So what does that word mean anyway? Parakletos can mean a lawyer who pleads your case or a witness who testifies on your behalf. It can refer to a person who gives comfort or counsel or strength in time of need or someone who comes along, comes to the aid or comes alongside of you. The literal meaning according to Barclay is someone who is called in to help. It's often translated advocate, counselor, intercessor, or excuse me, intercessor, one who comes alongside you. So you're starting to get the picture, right? Not only is the paraclete the Holy Spirit for us as Christ followers, but in this piece of scripture we just read, Jesus himself calls the Holy Spirit into play to further the mission that he can no longer carry out effectively in human form. The new paraclete, the Holy Spirit, is not limited by a body. He can be in two places at one time. He's not limited by space. He has the ability to be with all disciples everywhere at any time and be with them forever. So not only did God give his perfect son Jesus as a, as a sacrifice for our sins, he gives us the Holy Spirit as a guide in this life. So we don't have to wait until Jesus returns uh, to get his counsel or his help. If you, if you are in a relationship with him now or if you are just initiating that relationship, you have access to the person of Jesus Christ who is our, who is our paraclete. So you might ask, if you're not a Christ follower, how is that possible? How does this whole picture work? Remember the verse that I read to you a moment ago? We will un and we with unveiled faces all reflect God's glory, are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is his spirit. I want you to understand the significance of those words. God can enter human flesh. God can enter human flesh. Certainly the, the circumstances of Jesus were unique, but the Holy Spirit, the giving of the Holy Spirit in our lives is not so much. In fact, the truth is that from, from the beginning of that time, God has continued to incarnate himself into human flesh. He continues uh, throughout, the, throughout the history and the lives of his children through the person of the Holy Spirit to make us like himself from the inside out. So I just wanted to share something with you that has been going on in my life lately. If, 
if you've been in service during prayer time, you have probably heard me talk about, I guess for lack of a better word, a, a, a holy incident that has taken place in my life. So one, this, was, it, this took place about three months ago. One, one day I was doing my devotions at the kitchen table. And I had been reading this book by John Eldridge called Being Fathered by God. And the subtitle is Learning Things That Your, Your Father Could Never Teach You. And I had something happen to me. This week we were talking, that chapter that, we, that I was reading that day was about Christ as the lover of our soul. And as I sat there in my chair that day, for the first time in my life, I felt the weight of the love of Christ for me. Everything that I had known in my ears, between my ears, sunk down into my chest. And I had... There was a fundamental shift, I think, in my soul. And the reason I'm telling you this is because it's the direct work, working of the Holy Spirit. And so this, this just began to happen inside of me. And I was trying to relate to you the depth of that, how, how that really hit me. So I'm about seven years into my marriage, and Rhonda's dad is over to the house one day, and he's helping me with a, a work project. All of these years that we've been married, I've always called him Rod. Their name is Rod and Sherry. I called her mom. It was really easy, but I called him dad. He was so intimidating to me. He didn't try to be intimidating. He just, he just knew so much. Everything that he touched worked, and I just felt like I could do nothing right. This guy had it. He could do anything. He didn't, he didn't mean to feel that way, to make me feel that way. It was just a dad being a dad. And so he's over helping me in our house one day. And I realized that he was not there just because I was married to his daughter. He wasn't there to just help me out. He was there because he loved me. And so he was coming down the steps that day. And I remember he stopped about halfway down the steps. And I said, hey, Dad. Or I said, hey, Rod. I said, do you have just a minute? And the Holy Spirit was working inside of me. And I just said, Dad, or Rod, I said, I feel like that you're not here just because I'm married to your daughter. Or you're not here just because you want to help me do this job. I began to feel like he was there because he was there to father me. And so anyway, the, the, the short side of the story is I said, Rod, can I, can I just call you dad? Is it okay if I call you dad? And he said yes. What I want you to understand is that at the kitchen table today, that's, that day, that's what happened to me. As the love of the Holy Spirit, the love of our Father, just came upon me, I understood for the first time that he loved me like a dad. That was the work of the Holy Spirit, the wonderful counselor that we have access to. I know that we have this perception of God as being this this person that is so intimidating. He's, he's not intimidating. Can I just tell you that? He's not intimidating. He's just the God who does know it all. But he wants to father us. He wants to love us like a dad. That is what happened to me. And it has made just a fundamental shift in how it is that I see Jesus Christ. So if you are here today and you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, it's available to you. If you're here and you're just trying to, you need a little bit of peace in your life, it's available to you. All you have to do is look inside of you because the truth is, that God came to this earth in the form of a baby, that he grew up into a man, that he was crucified on a cross, that he died, and that he has come back in the person of the Holy Spirit, and he resides inside of you.
Will you guys pray with me for just a minute? Heavenly Father, we recognize that you still desire to enter human flesh. This was not a one-time event that took place when you came into this earth as a person who was named Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, I just pray that you would help us to be aware of your great love for your people. You are not an intimidating father. You just know everything that we don't know. Lord, I just pray that we would get to a place in our lives where we would move from calling you God to a place where we could call you Daddy. At this point in my life, it would be an offense if I called my father by his first name. He's my dad. He's made me feel like he was his dad. I've never been made to feel like an in-law. Father, I thank you so much that you have never made us, your adopted children, feel like in-laws. We thank you for the gift of your son. But Father... I thank you today for the gift of your Holy Spirit who has been at work in my life. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would be at work in the lives of these people. God, I pray that the hearts in this place today would be so stirred that they would not be able to leave this place without entering into a relationship with you. You make that possible through our wonderful counselor who is the Holy Spirit. God, I pray that you would just continue to move in this place. As we close the surface, I'm just going to be down front. If, if you would just like somebody to pray with you, if you would like to make that commitment to Christ today, if you're a Christ follower here and you just want to let God move into deeper areas of your life, come on up. I would love to pray with you. Don't miss out on opening the most extravagant gift that you could ever receive. The person of Jesus Christ inside, manifest inside of you through the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Father, for this day. Thank you for your goodness towards us, for your presence here in this service. In the name of Jesus, amen.